is is a is a very interesting topic for many reasons, and one of them is that at least in America, people associate entrepreneurship with begging somebody for money. So uh, there's a huge selection of people like asking for venture capital funding, and and then if you look in kind of go into the people that are dealing out the money and their phil- philosophy, it may be very different than the way you personally view the world. Like I, I have uh, spent a lot of time in um, the Bay Area living there. And I just personally just do not agree like philosophically with libertarianism, anarchism, um, you know, like, uh, you know, concentration of wealth. Those are all things I just don't believe in. I, I think it makes the world a, a bad place. So then if I was going to be an entrepreneur, you know, then I would I would beg these people who I don't agree with for money, and then they become my boss. So I don't really even call that entrepreneurship. I, I would say the the solopreneurship or freelancing is actually entrepreneurship. And so now the the question with this is like, yeah, how do you actually succeed? Because if you have zero money, how can you possibly survive? And I think that's the probably the the trickiest initial problem to overcome. And so I'd say a few ways to start with this would be that the ideal scenario is to start with uh, a situation where you're currently employed. So if you have some revenue uh, from a job, it's much easier to kind of go into the mode where you're going to start off on your own. And the the I would say the number one problem isn't necessarily getting work or you know figuring out what product to sell, et cetera. The number one problem is can you survive? That's that's the number one problem, and so there's there's actually a, there's a lot of ways to do this. So so one of them is, you know, if you had let's say a couple years worth of um, living expenses, that might be good enough. And so you you maybe you don't need to do anything. Like if you you know are fortunate enough to live somewhere where it's low cost and you have you know a couple years worth of living expenses that could be the, the the way to go and and you initially have it if you don't if you live in a high cost region this might be a a time to start to think about like do i really need to be here like like let, let's take some of the highest cost places in the world new york uh the bay area uh canada um some some of these regions hong kong there's a lot of good reasons to live there if you're going to have a corporate job if you're going to work for yourself, there may not be a good reason to to live there. And so I think that might be one of the the things that's really important to first figure out is the strategy of how do you reduce the burn rate for yourself so that you can survive long enough to be successful. And then it can you actually also have, you know, again, a couple years worth of living expenses. And I think it's amazing how many people don't talk about that with entrepreneurship is, is your personal burn rate, I think is way more important than anything else initially so that you can, you can survive. And so that's phase one. So then, then I think then, and then let's say that you do have this, right. You have a little bit of cushion. Maybe you've chose, you know, like done some data science, like everyone here knows some data science, you know, pick like uh, go to numbio.com, which has a, uh, cost of living um, rankings and find like sweet spots, right? So find, you know, a nice place to live that's in a city somewhere that's beautiful, you know, uh, potentially has got uh, democratic values, a um, maybe like some healthcare, <laughs> some, maybe they, you know, the number one cause of death for children is in guns, you know, so, something like that and, and, and find that place and then keep a very low cost of living. And then from there, you, you can go on to phase two. So then phase two would be to 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 think about di- diversification. Um, and you know, if you look at uh, what a venture capitalist does, they actually are asking many people that either are employee or even the founders to to take an incredible risk, right? So they they want someone to work, you know, hundred hour weeks or you know, put all of their time and energy into a startup, but then the venture capitals do the opposite of that. Why? Because it's dumb to do that. It's it's smart to, to actually invest in a hundred companies and that's why they do it. And, and so the same thing for you is when you're, when you're figuring out what to do, the worst possible scenario is to, you know, you, let's say you've got everything figured out in phase one, low cost of living, you have some money is to put all of your eggs in one basket and then get one client that even if they pay you double what you got paid 
when you're working for somebody else, that's bad because you've got all your eggs in one basket and eventually all clients turn bad, right? And for whatever reason, it could be they leave, you know, they could want to consume all of your resources, et cetera. So when you're in the consulting phase, it's important to have, uh, let's say like three, three clients, some kind of level of diversifications. And even if you have a dream client that's paying you double what, what you get paid regularly, you should intentionally limit that client so that you have time to prospect for more clients and also time to, to diversify your income. So it's kind of counterintuitive, like, oh, wait, you're giving me so much money. Shouldn't I put all my time? No. And th- this is the, 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 the way you think when you're an employee is like, oh, I got to go all in on one thing. But in fact, you want to be very careful so that ideally you would have something like 60% of your time each week would be dedicated to three clients who pay more than enough for you to survive and and even earn a profit that you can keep. But then the other maybe couple of days of the week, uh, let's say you worked one day each for each person, you could spend time you know, either looking for other things to do or even better, working on things where you get paid when you don't have to physically be there. And that's where the you know, writing books, creating content, investing, you know, those kinds of things come in. And so this is something I wrote about in a book that was like halfway, halfway finished at some point I might finish it called uh, uh, red, yellow, green money. And so the concept is when you're working for somebody else, that's red, that's dangerous. You think it's safe, but it's actually, especially in America, America is a, is a, is an ultra capitalist society where they fire you, you know, basically for anything, uh, and I think since 1980 and beyond, you really started in 1950. If you read uh, Thomas, Thomas Piketty, Capital, it's a very dense book, but it fully explains the fact that you're screwed if you're in America. <laughs> Basically, you, you don't want to work for corporations in America because they'll just they'll 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 extract what they need and and get rid of you. So that's the red money. Even if you're getting paid five hundred thousand dollars a year working for Google, you're still in trouble because you're you're basically anything could go wrong. And in fact, in some sense, it's even worse getting paid $500,000 a year because now you live in the Bay Area, you you, you have a mortgage that's $10,000 a month. And then how are you ever going to replace that, that, that income? You can't, they pay you more than anyone else does. And now you may even have to do unethical things because you're forced <laughs> to, to pay your mortgage. So the, the, I, I personally think that the red money is very dangerous. Instead, it would be good to live somewhere that's low cost re- work remote for one of those corporations temporarily put the majority of the money away. And then you go to yellow money, which is what I was just discussing. And that's really the consulting a- angle where you have two, two, three clients. And, and, and again, the beautiful thing about consulting is that, especially if you've done it, if you start to do it for like a few years is what you realize is, is you, 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 instead of being fired constantly, you're firing other people. And, and and you're basically saying, oh, you're unethical. I don't I want to work with you. Or your values don't represent my values. I'm not going to work with you. Or you're a jerk to me. I'm not going to work with you. Or you could just say, hey, this is great. You're one of my core clients. We're all on the same page. You you have a lot of power. And then additionally, because you've changed from a parasitic relationship where like, you know, in, in, in the corporate world, you, you have to basically like do whatever someone says to, to survive. When you when you have three clients and they know you're talented, they're they're very concerned about losing you because you have uh you know basically can leave at any moment in time, and so now it's a very different relationship. So I would say the yellow money or the consulting, there's a lot to like about that because you have power over your life. Maybe in in many places cases for the first time ever, someone has power over their life. And when you, and so what I would define as power over your life is when you wake up in the morning, you can do whatever you want. Most people, when they wake up in the morning, they cannot do whatever they want. They have to do what their boss tells them to do. And maybe even for like a week, you could get away with doing whatever you want or, or two weeks. Eventually <laughs> you will have to do what someone says. If you're consulting, you really don't because you have multiple sources of income. And if again, one of the people you're working with is they seem to be unpleasant or just for whatever reason you don't want to you don't want to work with them then you can get rid of them now there's danger because you have to constantly keep the three balls in the air right and you have to juggle those three balls but I, in my opinion it's a better way to go through life now 
that's still the yellow because there's some danger there because you know you still have to work because every everything ultimately depends on your output if you're a super productive person you know you could do that forever in fact there's a book called million dollar consultant and i've read it twice and the person that wrote it is actually uh, legit because I've done the same thing he's done and I would vouch that he's saying the truth. But I think there's even a better scenario than multi, you know, million dollar consultant, which is green money, which is that the dream scenario is you work really, really hard and you create intellectual property of some kind. And then the intellectual property pays you for the rest of your life. So that could be YouTube channel. It could be a book. It could be courses you know, build a course for data camp. It could be lots of different things. You could have an Airbnb, you know, you could um, have a rental property, wh whatever it is that you're, you're, you're choosing to do, or it could be a combination of all of those. And that's what I would call the green money. And, and, uh, you know, it's, you've heard this in maybe different forms, but basically if you don't figure out a way to make money while you sleep, I think uh, Warren Buffett said this, you're going to work for the rest of your life. That's simple. So I think that's the ultimate scenario is a combination of the yellow money and the green money consulting and the passive income. And again, it, it could be a, a combination of things. And even a better is if the passive income is non-correlated, right? So like an Airbnb and like a book on technology are very uncorrelated. They have almost nothing to do with each other. That's great. Like if you can kind of piece together things. And once you start to, to build assets like that, that pay you out, it really doesn't have to be a huge win. If you get paid $150 a month for one thing and a thousand from another, and then 500 from another, and you start to add it up, eventually it turns actually into a big deal, but it can take a long time. It can take years and years and years to build that up. But I would argue that the alternative is pretty dire, especially again, if you read books like by Robert Reich, a Berkeley professor, or Thomas Piketty, and you start to look at what's actually happening in the world and the way that uh, the corporate structure is, it's very scary. And so you could make the argument that you have no choice, even if you don't want to, to, to actually have something where you're working for yourself. The alternative is the CEO will get paid 1,400, 2,000, 5,000 times what you get paid and eventually you just get discarded. So do you even have a choice but to do something that has some solopreneurship involved in it. So that's my, that's probably my like 20 minutes of propaganda.